conference running. Uh, this is part one of a two part series that I'm putting on. Uh, my name is Dan Nash. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at Cardiff Metropolitan University, and I'm looking at ways of monitoring training loads and endurance runners and triathletes. Uh, so I'm working in partnership with Welsh Athletics and Welsh Triathlon. Uh, I'm also a South Wales coach working with Welsh Athletics uh, and a Welsh and GB international runner. Uh, and I uh, represented GB at the 50K World Championships uh, back in September. Okay, so the aims of this workshop. Uh, so first, uh, one of the aims of this workshop is to break down some of the jargon around endurance physiology. There's lots of terms banded around, such as VO2 max, lactic thresholds, lactate turn points, running economy, etc. Um, and they can all become a bit confusing. Uh, some people, uh, there's a lots of misnomers around certain areas. So hopefully I'm gonna, I'm gonna clarify some of those terms and that will give us a good, a good grounding so we can go into a bit more detail in some areas then. Uh, so as part of that, I want to, want to uh, help um, develop a common understanding and a common language around some of this terminology. So that actually um, we can have better conversations between coaches. If we all know what VO2 max is, we can talk about and have a conversation around VO2 max uh, much more effectively. Um, yeah, and then we also, I also want to uh, establish a training toolkit as part of this workshop. Uh, and by that, I mean, uh, I'm going to look at the training zones and look at which tensities will lead to which uh, adaptations and which, which intensities and which training zones I should use to help improve certain, certain parameters of endurance performance. So that's the aims of this workshop. Uh, just before we, we start properly, uh, I'm going to ask a question, what is exercise physiology? Um, so hopefully you've all got a bit of an idea of what exercise physiology is as you've chosen to attend this webinar but if i just give a brief introduction to what what actually exercise physiology is then uh, that'll be a good place to start so if, if we drop the exercise bit and just talk about physiology physiology is and physiologists study how the body works and that's how the body works at rest in a healthy state and how the body works during disease. An exercise physiologist then looks at how the body responds to exercise. Uh, so this might be during exercise. An example here, I've got someone in the lab, I'm measuring their heart rate, I'm seeing how their heart's functioning during exercise. I'm measuring their oxygen consumption, uh, their CO2, um, how much of that they're, they're breathing out. Uh, and I'm also looking at what's happening in the blood. I'm looking at their blood lactate. So a physiologist will look at how a body responds to exercise, but also uh, how they'll recover from exercise and the training adaptations that lead to an improved fitness, or if you're doing too much, uh, lead to overtraining and a decrease in performance levels. Uh, so yeah, a physiologist basically looks at uh, how the body works and responds to exercise. But how can an exercise physiologist help me? Uh, so you're probably already benefit, benefiting from a lot of the, the knowledge that's already been derived by exercise physiologists, things such as um, uh, fueling for, for performance, uh, energy gels, a lot of this research being done by exercise physiologists. Uh, some of the things in this webinar that I'm going to include is identifying training zones, uh, and linking, uh, linking these training zones with specific adaptations. Uh, and a physiologist can also help with the design of the overall training plan. So if you have to make sure that athletes have got suitable training load, they're not doing too much training, or if they're doing insufficient training, uh, and things like that. So there's, there's, they can, there's lots of ways that an exercise physiologist can, can help uh, a coach and uh, endurance runners or or any, any endurance discipline. So if we move on to section one then, understanding the, the jargon. So I'm just gonna go through a, a few key words and phrases. Uh, hopefully you've all come across them before. If not, don't panic, but all things that are, all phrases are often used by coaches and, and a part of the um, coaching education program.
so first, aerobic metabolism and uh, VO2 max. Uh, so aerobic metabolism, is, as you ho should hopefully all know, is the main way we, we release energy during endurance running. So anything, any event over two minutes is, is primarily fueled by, um, by the aerobic metabolism. And by this, it means we, uh, we, we inhale oxygen, we transport it through the blood, pumped by the heart uh, to the working muscles, and then we use oxygen to release energy from, from carbohydrate stores and from fat stores uh, to help us, help us run uh, faster and, uh, and allow for muscle contraction. Yeah, so most events, uh, so all events uh, in, the, in the endurance category are primarily fueled by aerobic metabolism. Uh, so that brings us on to VO2 max. So VO2 max is the maximum capacity of, of, of the aerobic system. So how uh, the maximum amount of oxygen that, that can be used by the working muscles to release energy from our fuel stores. So if you look at the, uh, the, the, the graph on the, the right of your screen, uh, we, we measure VO2 max um, in the lab, getting people to run on the treadmill. So they, they start at a nice slow speed uh, and we'll measure their oxygen consumption using a, a face mask. And as you can see, as, as speed increases, oh, let me just get a, a marker up here, a laser pointer. So as, uh, as speed increases, oxygen consumption goes up in a nice linear fashion. Uh, so from 12 kilometers all the way up to 20 kilometers an hour, there's a nice linear increase in uh, oxygen consumption. And, and by that, there's a nice linear increase in aerobic metabolism. But when we get to about 20, 21, 22 kilometers an hour, that starts to plateau. Uh, and this, this is uh, the VO2 max value here. And for this athlete, it's, it's 70 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute. And that number represents the maximum capacity for aerobic metabolism. So any, any further increase in speed here is due to uh, the other side of a coin, which is anaerobic metabolism. And that's how this athlete is maintaining speeds, uh, maintaining an increase in speed without any increase in, in uh, aerobic metabolism. Uh, so VO2 max is a really, it's a really high intensity if you're operating at VO2 max. It's a speed that you can only... Uh, sustain for between five or ten minutes depending upon the in individual uh, and we'll look at some reasons why that is in, in the next slide. So yeah the other side of the coin is uh, anaerobic metabolism and a product of anaerobic metabolism being being lactate. So anaerobic metabolism is, is a really uh, great thing in that it can release a lot of energy really quickly. So if we look at this, uh, this chart at the bottom here, uh, we've got the 100 meter event, and this is the, the contribution of the aerobic and anaerobic system to the event. So the 100 meters requires lots of energy to be released really quickly. And so primarily anaerobic metabolism is fueling the 100 meters, almost exclusively anaerobic uh, metabolism is, is fueling 100 meter, uh, 100 meter race speed. On the other hand, then uh, you've got the marathon, uh, which is the opposite, almost almost exclusively aerobic, and only a small uh, contribution of anaerobic metabolism uh, to the to the energy demands. Yeah, so anaerobic metabolism is good, and they can release a lot of energy really quickly, but it's also got its downsides. So it also produces a lot of waste products, such as hydrogen ions, and these uh, lead to acidification. Uh, and fatigue. These, these, these waste products build up and they cause fatigue. Uh, so that's why we can't just sustain anaerobic metabolism indefinitely. That's why that the, the marathon um, has got only a small anaerobic contribution because the anaerobic metabolism, a high level of anaerobic metabolism can't be sustained for a long period. So another product of anaerobic metabolism is, is lactate. Uh, and lactate is not a waste product itself. It's not lactate that's causing um, the burn in a, in a 1500 meter race. Uh, that's a misnomer, um, but it is a product of anaerobic metabolism. Uh, and one of the advantages of lactate is that um, you can use it as a fuel source. 
so lactate can actually be taken up by the muscles and used and metabolized just like carbohydrate and glycogen uh, to produce energy. And it's also really easy to measure as well. So um, if you, you can measure lactate using a, a, a blood sample, just a, a finger prick blood sample, and you can measure lactate. And lactate then is a, uh, can, can be used as a surrogate measure for, for anaerobic metabolism. So the more anaerobic metabolism that is occurring, the higher the lactate production. So for example, if we look at the 1500 meter event here, uh, there's um, uh, mostly fueled by aerobic metabolism, but a good chunk of anaerobic metabolism as well. And so an, an elite athlete might produce uh, 20 millimoles of lactate at the end of the 1500 meters. Uh, on the other hand, at the, at the end of a marathon, your lactate is probably only going to be uh, two or three millimoles. And so that's, that's indicative of the amount of anaerobic metabolism uh, that's, being, that's being used to, to, to sustain each speed. So if we move on then to the next slide, that leads us nicely into the lactate threshold uh, and the lactate turn point. Now, these are two terms that get banded around quite a lot. And there's lots of other terms such as uh, the aerobic threshold and the anaerobic threshold and the ventilatory threshold the maximal lactate steady state, these are all terms that mean almost exactly the same thing, uh, which makes it quite confusing to talk about. So the, the terms we're going to use are the lactate threshold and the lactate term point. And to explain these two terms, I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to talk you through a test that, um, that we do, that we use to measure uh, the lactate threshold and the lactate term point. So if you look at the graph on the right hand side of the screen, this is actually data from myself. This is a test that I did just a few days from before I ran 218 uh, at the Bryson Marathon back in, well, basically this time last year. So how the test works is uh, after a warm up, uh, I, on the treadmill, we start, I started doing a number of stages. You do a five minute stage. At the end of each stage, I have my blood lactate measured. Uh, then I jump back on at a slightly higher, faster speed, do exactly the same, another five minute stage, another blood, blood lactate measurement. Yeah, so on this graph here, we've got speed on the bottom. So I started at 15 kilometers an hour, and we've got lactate on the side here in, in millimoles per liter. Uh, so uh, to start with, I, yeah, I started at 15 kilometers an hour, and my lactate was about 1.3. And 1.3, this is the same value that I, you'd measure if I was sitting on the sofa. If I was sitting on the sofa at home and you measured my blood lactate or anyone's blood lactate, it would still be a nice low value. So this is a baseline level. It's not gone above the normal resting values of lactate. Same again at 16 kilometers an hour, same again at 17 kilometers an hour. But if we go just a little bit faster, if we go to 17 and a half kilometers an hour, my lactate started to go up off of a started to go above baseline levels. So this is what we call the lactate threshold here. So it's the fastest speed that you can run at without generating any lactate above baseline levels. So as I go a bit faster, the amount of lactate that's being produced within the cells, uh, within the muscle, uh, is spilling out of the fibers and into the bloodstream. So lactate starts to go up a little bit. So 17 and a half, 18, 18 and a half, it started to go off a bit, but it's still not really high. Uh, remember after a 1500 meter race, I said you could, you could, some people can produce as much as 20 millimoles of lactate. And we're only at three millimoles here, so it's not really high yet. And that's, that's, that's due to a number of reasons. Uh, partly there's not much anaerobic metabolism going on, but we're also taking up some of that lactate by uh, other muscles and other systems, and they can metabolize it, like I said earlier, and use it as a fuel source. Uh, and then if we go up to 19k an hour, uh, again, we're still, uh, we're only at four millimoles, um, but just a little bit faster again to 19 and a half, and we've jumped quite a lot higher. So from 18 and a half to 19, we've gone up by just a single millimole per litre. But if we go from 19 to 19 and a half, just another half an hour increment, that goes up to seven millimoles per litre. That's a three, nearly a three millimole jump in, in lactate. Uh, and for reference, 19 kilometers an hour is 505 a mile, 19 and a half 
um, is just under five minute mile and it's 4.57 a mile. So just a, just a few seconds faster per mile uh, and lactate goes up quite a lot. Now these, uh, and so this here is the lactate turn point. So you've got the lactate threshold at 17 kilometers an hour, the lactate turn point at 19 kilometers an hour. So that's where there's a sudden big increase in lactate um, uh, and it's going away from this linear um, increase here. So these two points, they aren't arbitrary, they're really, they're really important. So they're big markers of performance. You can sustain uh, the lactate threshold here for about three hours, give or take, depending on the individual. Uh, the lactate turn point here, you can, you can sustain that for roughly an hour, it roughly correlates with your one hour race pace. Um, so obviously, if we can improve these markers, that's going to allow us to run faster for, for, for a less stressful experience. So if I can move the lactate threshold from 17 kilometers an hour to 18 kilometers an hour, 18 kilometers an hour is now much less stressful and we can sustain it for a much longer period of time. So that's the lactate threshold and the lactate turn point. We'll, we'll be talking a bit more about them uh, in the next few slides. But first, running economy. Uh, so again, running economy is a really important uh, factor in performance. And it's basically how well you convert energy into speed. How well can you use that oxygen that you're breathing in to release energy within the muscles and convert that into running speed? Uh, so one factor um, that influences running economy is, is your running technique. And I've got a picture of Elio de Kipchoge here because he's a, he's a really nice looking runner. His technique is, is, really, is really something amazing to behold. And he's a very economical because of that. So running technique is really important. Uh, another factor is, is reactive strength. So if you haven't come across reactive strength before, uh, this is different to pure strength. For example, how much you can squat, how much you can deadlift. Uh, reactive strength is, is sort of how quickly you can apply force. So when your, your foot comes and hits the ground and it can bounce off really quickly, you've got good reactive strength. You can activate that muscle really quickly and bounce off the ground. So that's gonna make you economical. On the other hand, if you, if you had poor reactive strength, you would hit the ground, you'd spend a long time off the, on the ground and slowly bounce back off. That would be poor reactive strength and that's uneconomical. Then another factor is, is neural recruitment. Um, and that's to do with switching on and off the right muscles at the right times and using, using the muscles as an effective way to produce force. And I'm not going to go into more detail there, but if you're interested in, in any of these things, reactive strength, neural recruitment, uh, I would go and go do some reading around that area. So that brings us on to our next section, and that's, that's training zones. I'm gonna talk about uh, why, why do we use them and, and how can we identify them? So there's nothing really special about training zones. It's just a way of, of categorizing and standardizing the speeds that are available to us. So every speed from jogging all the way up to maximal sprinting, uh, it's just start dividing it into training zones allows us to to, um, to quantify uh, what's going on in that area. It allows us to, um, to, to better predict what adaptations we're gonna get from that training zone. Uh, and it allows us to, to prescribe training more easily and, and how to, and it allows us to, to talk about training as I'm gonna do now more easily. If we all know what zone four is, then it's much more e easily easier for coaches and athletes to talk about what's actually happening in that, in that zone for areas, which is just a way of understanding training more effectively and prescribing training, understanding training more effectively. So I'm gonna talk through each zone now, starting from the slowest to the fastest. Uh, if you look at my graph here, we've got speed at the bottom. So we've got slow is at this end, and fast is at this end. We then on the left-hand side got the percentage of max heart rate, and that's the orange line here at the top. And then on the other side, we've got a lactate, blood lactate, uh, and that's the blue line here. So if we start with zone one or recovery, uh, so this is a really comfortable zone. This is really sustainable. The pace should feel subjectively really easy. Lactate 
on the bottom is still at baseline value, so we're well below the lactate threshold, and heart rate is still is below 65% of heart rate max. So heart rate is nice and low, uh, lactate is low, and subjectively this feels really easy. You can have a good conversation with your friends, you could, you could sing if you had to. We then go up to zone two, or easy. So this is a little bit harder. Uh, lactate is at baseline levels, but it goes all the way up to the lactate threshold here. So the borderline of this zone is uh, the, the lactate threshold, or the fastest speed you can run at without producing any lactate and releasing any lactate into the blood. Uh, and this correlates, as I said earlier, with roughly a three hour race pace, or the pace you could sustain for three hours in a race duration. So for some people that might be the marathon pace, it might be a bit slower, a bit faster, depending, depending on the athlete that you're working with. Uh, a heart rate goes up to about 75% of, of heart rate max, roughly 75% of heart rate max. So a little bit harder than zone one, but still you should be able to have a good conversation. You should still not feel too difficult, especially at the lower ends of the zone here. So next we move to zone three or steady. Uh, so this is between the lactate threshold here and the lactate turn point. So lactate's gone up above baseline, but it's not spiked really, really high yet. Uh, and, that, and the lactate turn point, as I said, correlates roughly with the pace you could sustain for an hour in a race with, with maximal intensity. Uh, heart rate's going from about 75% of heart rate max up to, up to about 85, 87% of, of heart rate max. So this is starting to feel a bit hard now. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's a steady effort. You can sustain it for quite a long period of time. You can sustain it for, for up, to, up to three hours uh, if you really had to in a race situation, but it, it's becoming a bit harder now. It's a bit more stressful on the body. Uh, and yeah, it's no longer a comfortable, sustainable zone. So next we've got zone four, uh, and this is just above the lactate turn point up to about 30 minute race intensity. Uh, so whatever, whatever speed you could sustain for 30 minutes roughly in, 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 a, um, in, a max, in, a, in a race situation. So lactate's gone up to about eight. So we've gone from about four millimoles here roughly up to about eight millimoles. And now we're in the, yeah, the tempo zone. So this is really getting quite hard now. Heart rates from 85%, 87% up to about uh, up to about 90, 92% of heart rate max. So it's, it's a hard zone, but we can still sustain this for quite a long period of time. It's not a really all out effort. We could sustain it for an up to an hour if we had to at, the, at this end or, or 30 minutes at this end of the zone. So now we've got zone five, which is hard. Now this really is hard. We're, we're, we're going to 90, 92% of heart rate max up to about 100% of heart rate max. This, is, this correlates with intensities up to about six minutes, I've written 10 minutes here, but up to about six minute race intensity. So from 30 minutes up to a six minute race intensity, what you could sustain for six minutes. And this is sort of a VO2 max zone really, because you're using, you're using if not all of your VO2 max, you're using a good percentage of it. So 95% and above of the VO2 max. And, and remember VO2 max is your ana the aerobic metabolism. So you're using your entire capacity for aerobic metabolism. Then we've got one more zone, and that's zone six, and this is a sprint zone. This is slightly different from the rest of the zones in that uh, you can't categorize it really by heart rate or lactate, and it's more to do with velocity. So it's basically uh, maximal velocity sprinting and just, just slightly slower than maximal velocity. So if we think 400 meter race pace, that speed and faster. Uh, so there are your six zones that we're gonna talk about. So zone one, recovery, a really comfortable zone all the way up to zone six. And this is just a way of, of categorizing all the intensities that are available to us. So next I'm gonna talk through each one of these zones. I'm gonna go into a bit more detail about uh, how you can identify the zone if you haven't got access to a lab uh, and how, um, what adaptations you get from, from working in, in these zones. Uh, so firstly zone one and two, or easy and recovery. Now I've lumped these two zones in together because they're quite similar adaptations you get for, from, from working in these two zones. You could think of it as just one big zone if you, if you like. So heart rate is under 70-75% of max. 
you can easily have a conversation as you might notice here but this is this is myself and my partner we're we're running along at a nice easy intensity you can easily have a conversation and you typically perform zone one and zone two in sessions for at least 20 minutes uh, up to several hours so you probably need to run for at least 20 minutes to get any adaptations uh, uh, otherwise yeah you probably need to be doing at least 20 minutes of running um, uh, and marathoners and ultra marathoners might be might be out for a couple of hours several hours so most of your training should be in these two zones or most of your uh, most of your yeah, athletes training should be in in zones one and zones two um, so most of your training should actually be really quite comfortable and easy uh, and, and, and studies into uh, the best runners in the world, be that the East Africans or the Europeans or the Americans, the best runners in the world tend to spend at least at least 80 to 90 percent of their training time in these two zones. So most of their training is easy. Only between 10 and 20 percent is in that zone three, zone four, zone five, zone six area. 80 to 90 percent of their training is in zone one and zone two. And there's lots of uh, there's lots of good reasons for this. There's lots of beneficial adaptations that can be that are associated with with easy, comfortable running. Um, so, thing easy running will improve your running economy. It will improve your lactate thresholds. Uh, if you're not very well trained, it will even improve your VO2 max. It's also just good for general fatigue ability. It's good fatigue. It will uh, develop good just general fatigue resistance. It will allow you to handle more training. And, and it will allow you to yeah, tolerate more uh, zone four, zone five, zone six work and recover from it much better. Uh, and because of these uh, adaptations, it's no surprise really that training volume is the biggest predictor of performance. So if you look at a, a group of runners and you look at their VO2 max and their running economy uh, and their lactate thresholds, etc., the biggest distinguisher of performance in the longer events is actually the total training volume that they accumulate. Uh, and, and this necessitates that actually, if you wanna have a big training volume, most of it is gonna to have to be an easy intensity, so zone one, zone two, because if, it's, if you're starting to do zone three and zone four work, you're gonna fatigue quicker and it's just not gonna be sustainable. So actually, most of your training week and most of your training program should be centered around uh, zone one and zone two, easy, uh, and recovery running. So that brings us on to zone three or steady. So this is uh, from your three hour race pace up to your one hour race pace roughly. Uh, and I said, as I said earlier, it's between your lactate threshold and your lactate turn point. So you can see in this table here, zone three, uh, lactate's gone above baseline levels, but it's not spikes off really high. Um, so you, you can talk, but you, you probably reduce to short sentences. You, you couldn't sing, uh, you, you couldn't have an in-depth conversation about a topic. Uh, yeah, and 70 to 85% of heart rate max, roughly, depending on the individual. Uh, so for a lot of people, marathon intensity falls into this zone. And this is why we've got Josh Griffiths here, international uh, marathon runner for, for Swansea Harriers. So he, when he's performing his marathon, he'll be operating in the zone three or steady zone. So lactate will be above baseline levels, but it won't be really, really high. It won't be above his lactate turn point. So there's lots of beneficial adaptations you can get from zone three or steady running. Uh, it's really good for, for improving your lactate thresholds. It's good for fat promoting fat metabolism. Uh, and it's essential if you're gonna be doing a good marathon, you wanna spend some time at marathon race pace. However, there's a, a middle road trap that you don't want to fall in. So if you're doing zone three work, this should be uh, an in, in a high intensity session. So you should class it as a high intensity session. It shouldn't be a replacement for zone one and zone two work. So the danger is that if, if your um, zone three work is, is much more stressful than working in zone one and zone two. So if all your easy runs start to get a bit faster and actually are oh, you starting to push it a bit and it starts getting to zone three and you're starting to, your, your lactate is starting to go above baseline levels, this is going to be significantly more stressful. And if you, all your runs are becoming zone three runs, you're going to be uh, too fatigued to do your high intensity sessions. So when you go and do your zone four and zone five and zone six work, you, you're going to be too tired if all your runs have been zone three. 
and it's also going to stop you from accumulating a good volume. Uh, and as I said, volume is the biggest predictor of performance in, in the endurance athletes. So if you can't, if you're doing too much during the three work, it's going to limit your the amount of volume that you can accumulate. And you're not going to be able to put back to back good weeks together if you're just getting progressively more tired and fatigued because you're always just pushing a little bit on those on those supposedly easy runs. But if you are going to do a zone three uh, session, um, which I think everyone should be doing at some point, uh, a good example could be an hour progression run where you start at marathon pace and progress down to just a bit faster than half marathon pace. So you'd get some nice adaptations from that. So moving on to zone four then, or, or tempo. So now we're above the lactate turn point. So on our graph down here, lactate has gone, uh, we've gone above the lactate threshold, we've gone above the lactate turn point, and we're just above the, la the lactate turn point. So heart rate is going up to 85 to 92% of heart rate max. So we're somewhere in between there. Uh, and it corresponds to roughly yeah, yeah, one hour to 30 minute race intensity within that block. So you could say a few words, um, but again, you wouldn't be able to talk, you wouldn't be able to sing. Uh, so this is sort of a sweet spot uh, between intensity and duration. So it's quite intense. You're operating at a high percentage of your heart rate max and your high percentage of your VO2 max, but actually you can still accumulate quite a lot of duration. Uh, so an elite runner could, could, could do an hour's worth of work in this zone if you broke it up into, into different intervals. And one of the advantages here is, is that you can, you can have a high sustained lactate for a long period of time. And this is a great way of improving your lactate turn point because you're able to tolerate lactate and the other, the other byproducts of anaerobic metabolism, uh, but you're not going to swamp the systems. You can still get a really good chunk of time, at a, a quite a high intensity. An example session could be, um, I've put at the bottom here is, is five minute reps. Uh, a less well-developed athlete can, could, could, um, could do 25 minutes of work. So you might do five by five minutes with, with 60 seconds recovery. Uh, and as I said, a more experienced athlete could do up to 10 times five minutes with 60 seconds recovery. Uh, and so an example session I can give you that, that I did personally, before I did the 50K World Championships uh, in September, one of my last key sessions was I did 10 times a mile on the rows with a two minute jog recovery. Uh, and I managed to just sneak under five minute miling, which, which really pleased me perfect, uh, personally. But um, yeah, so that way I'm, I'm, producing, I'm producing some lactate, but I'm not swamping the system with metabolites and fatigue. I'll have a high heart rate and high lactate for an extended period of time. So this is, this is a really good uh, type of training session to include within, within a training program. So next we've got zone five or hard. And now this really is quite hard. Heart rate is high. We're at 92% of heart rate max and above. You can't really talk. You, you're operating at VO2 max or very close to VO2 max. Uh, and this corresponds with race intensities of uh, between six minutes and 30 minutes duration. So that might be your 2K time or up to your 10K time or depending on your ability. So we've got Melissa Courtney, now Melissa Bryant, uh, featuring in, uh, in this slide. And that's because she races for 1500 meters up to the 5K, so 1500 meters, 3K, 5K. Uh, and all of these events, you're using your entire aerobic capacity, your entire VO2 max. Uh, so obviously, if, if, you're, if, you're, um, if you're spending time at VO2 max, it makes sense for actually it's a, using this zone is a, is a good way to improve your VO2 max. So yeah, working in, working in this zone five zone is a good way of improving VO2 max. Uh, but, it, but it's also stressful on my body. And as you can imagine, if you're working at really close to maximum heart rate and maximum uh, VO2, VO2, it's really stressful. So actually you don't want to do loads of this, of this work within a program. Probably once a week is more than enough for, uh, for most athletes. And even then, if, if um, it might be that you just use more of it as you get towards the, the main season, especially if you're a middle distance runner, but during the, during the winter, you might do a bit less of this work. Uh, yeah, and compared to the zone four stuff, you can't do a big volume of this work within an individual session, probably between 10 and 30 minutes of work, depending on, on where exactly in the zone you're working. If you're working at 100% of VO2 max or just 95% of VO2 max. 
so yeah, you can't accumulate a lot of work. And that's because as well as using your whole aerobic metabolism, you're getting a, a big, uh, a, a big amount of anaerobic uh, metabolism as well. So there's lots of waste products being built up, which are going to cause fatigue. So an example session I've given is, is five times three minutes with two minutes recovery. Uh, you've got to be a bit careful in prescribing zone five work. Uh, if, uh, in terms of rep duration, uh, if it's too short, if it's only, if you're only giving someone a minute interval, you're not going to have enough time for, for your heart rate and your oxygen consumption to gear all the way up to VO2 max. So I'd suggest using two minute intervals at the shortest, otherwise there's just not enough time for heart rate and your oxygen consumption to, to build up to, to maximum values. On the other side, you don't want the rep that's too long. So if you're doing five minute reps, six minute reps, that's probably too long because you're going to get too fatigued and not be able to, to reach those heart rate and max values and your, your oxygen consumption values because you're getting such a buildup of, of uh, products from anaerobic metabolism that you're going to have to stop. It's going to stop you getting from those really high intensities. So I think a sweet spot is probably between two and four minutes in duration. And obviously you need adequate recovery so that you can keep uh, going to these high intensities. If recoveries are too short, then you, again, you're just going to get a big buildup of metabolites and fatigue and it's going to, uh, uh, you won't be able to reach those really high intensities. Uh, then next zone six and our last zone. So as I said, this is sprints or maximal or near maximal speeds. This is good for developing power, coordination and economy. So power being the amount of force that you can apply in a single uh, in a single um, strike of your foot of the ground and into coordination is sort of your muscular coordination how well you can switch on and switch off switch off um, your, your muscles um, yeah and as I said good for economy and good for that reactive strength uh, and it's also crucial for middle distance athletes if, you, if you're not got the basic speed that you need to, um, to be competitive um, then you're not going to be able to you're not going to be able to feature in middle distance events. You need some basic speed, but it's still good for those who are in, in, in. As I said, it's still good for uh, athletes competing in the longer events because it's good for power, it's good for economy, good for coordination. If you're new to to zone six work, or if you are taking part in the longer events where speed itself isn't so much of a uh, factor, then it's safest to be done on hills. And this is because it it's loads you slightly differently you, there's a, a less load for your joints you've got better running mechanics your foot is going to land uh, more you're going to land more on your forefoot just because of the nature of, of running up a hill uh, you're going to land under your center of mass a bit more and it's also going to change the emphasis more to strength and power instead of basic speed uh, in terms of the the rep duration they're going to have to be quite short otherwise you're not going to be able to maintain a, a maximal or near maximal speed you'll get too much fatigue. So between five and 30 seconds is good. And obviously recovery is going to be want to be really generous because if you, if you um, don't have generous recovery, then uh, you're not going to be able to perform maximal or near maximal velocities. So an example session here I, I've given is eight times 15 second hills, two minutes recovery. So that's, that's our, our zones, zone, uh, yeah, zone one to zone six. And uh, that's, that's basically it coming to the end of our presentation here. Some take home messages. Uh, think about which training zone you're in or, or what training zone you're prescribing, um, what training zone you're prescribing to athletes. Um, so for example, if you're a coach, are you prescribing an intensity for their, for their easy runs? Are, uh, are you just letting them to go and say, okay, go and do 40 minutes of running, go and do 60 minutes of running? Or are you giving them a specific intensity or zone to work in? Because if left to their own devices, there's a good chance that intensity is going to be too high and then they're going to be too fatigued when it comes to their, their high intensity sessions. Uh, and, and, and on that note, yeah, make sure that your training, that most of your training is easy. If, if you're doing four high intensity session, sessions a week, that is definitely too much. Most people, uh, especially if you're looking at more of a 10k and a half marathon, you don't need to do more than two sessions, hard sessions a week. Uh, and getting that balance between hard and easy is really, really important. And then also know the purpose of your hard sessions. Is this a zone four session or is it a zone five session? If it's a zone four session and I want to improve my lactate turn point, 
then uh, we need to make sure that the intensity isn't too hard because otherwise they, uh, they're not going to be able to accumulate uh, a good volume. So if, you, if uh, they've gone off at VO2 max pace instead of, uh, instead of uh, your zero and four pace, then that's going to quite quickly bring that session to a close. And instead of the, the eight by five minutes that you prescribed, they might be able to do three, but only be able to do three by five minutes. Uh, and that's not a fulfilling the purpose of a training session. If the purpose of a training session was to prove your lactate turn point, then you, you failed in that. So yeah, know the purpose of your hard sessions. And if you can, if you can get an athlete to buy in to why you're doing these hard sessions, then you're probably going to see more, more control and more maturity uh, in the execution. Yeah, so that's, that's the end of my presentation. If, you haven't, if you've got any um, questions that you haven't put into the Q&A function yet, do them now. 